Oh. Well, what do you say on your last day? Let us pray. Lord, let your good news come to us once again, not only with words, but in the Holy Spirit, with power and full assurance. Amen. Last weekend, I did my first full test run with my backpacking gear. I went to the nearest section of the Appalachian Trail from Bear Mountain to Graymoor and tested everything out. And I started out along a spacious ridge, and as I was hiking, I see this older gentleman walking toward me, and he spots my pack with a tent that's sort of half falling out and shoes strapped on, and his eyes get wider as he gets closer to me, and as if I were some sort of rare exotic species, he said, are you a through hiker? And I quickly corrected him, you know, a through hiker is like the people who are already on the trail for six months. And I said, no, but I'm kind of like training to someday be one, as if it were way in the future. I keep thinking that this day is way in the future, because I don't know how to train to say goodbye. But I also echo the words of the children that every goodbye is also a till we meet again. That day when that gentleman came up and asked me if I was a through hiker, I had the distinct feeling of imposter syndrome. Do you know what this is? It's a common feeling. It's where you feel vastly and woefully underqualified for whatever it is you're pretending to be doing. And you're absolutely convinced that if people found out about your gross incompetence, the whole jig would be up. It would all be exposed. Mind you, this is not like the new phenomena on many websites and internet shopping stores that test to see whether you are an imposter of a robot. Do you guys know these tests? Okay, is there anything worse than failing the robot test? <laughs> you guys, my friend posted about this this week, and I mean, it's really a struggle. Like, I will sit there and try to identify which boxes have cars and which boxes have rivers, but like sometimes the lines are a little blurry and it's not totally clear and the river looks like a bridge and so it makes me take it over and over again. And this test I am quite convinced would be way more successful if a robot actually were taking it. And so then the test just leaves me feeling neither like a robot nor a very smart person and also that I need new glasses. Which true story I got last week because of failing the said robot test. But I digress. Imposter syndrome fairly describes the way that I felt nearly 12 years ago when I set foot in this church. I remember within days of my arrival, I was asked to officiate a funeral and preside over a baptism. And I was sitting in my office thinking, oh my gosh, they actually think I'm a real minister. <laughs> like, maybe I shouldn't tell them. But here's the thing about ministry, and maybe adult life in general. If you show up, and you've got the gear, and you've got the costume, people see you on the trail, and it's time to go. <laughs> before you're an expert, before you're ready, before you know all the things, but never by yourself. Over the years, I have attempted numerous things that have been fun and interesting and attended, and I have tried things that have failed. I have blessed people, I hope, and I have also let people down. I have mistaken a sign for a bridge and a car for a road, and I have tried over and over again at the test of being human, let alone a pastor. I have come to this church week in and week out on good days and bad, not because I had this deep spiritual well of belief or crystal clear conviction, but because you called me minister. There have been so many days that you have believed with me and for me, and that is what has carried me. In a very real sense, you all have loved me into being your minister. And you have also loved me, Reformed Church, in the leaving. 
You have flooded me with emails and articles and coffees and advice and generosity and your own used gear from the 1970s and I'm so sorry that I'm not taking your sleeping bag. I'm so sorry, but I really am touched. You have also asked me a lot of questions about my gear. You have asked me how much does it weigh. You have asked me what I am bringing. You have asked me whether I think I can carry it. And so I'm just here to tell you, welcome to your exclusive tour of my pack right here. All right, so while I would really love if I could bring all my favorite high heels and my smoothie blender and a stack of books, um, you can't pack for where you've been. You gotta pack for where you're headed. So we've got the Crocs in pink, obviously, uh, for the, not for the trail, but of course for the campsite. And then on the trail, we've got some trail runners with good traction, wide toe bed. I am told I will go through at least four pair of these. Um, we've also got, let's see here, oh yes, the tent, which I am called I'm told this is not a tent, this is part of my shelter system, all right, according to the classes. And then you've got sleeping pads and sleeping bags, which are obviously called the sleep system. And then you've got a bunch of food somewhere, aka nutrition system. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, and you might be wondering, well, you know, enough with the systems, um, you know, what about the Bible? This is a sermon after all. I gotcha, I gotcha. Before we head to that, uh, all of these systems are supposed to total a combined weight of 20% of my body weight. So in preparation for the trail, I am also eating cake, like it is going out of style, all right? So coffee hour, like no more smoothies. It's just carbs, cake, all the time. But this, what can I leave you? For your own trail? What can I leave you as some prayer gear from these scriptures that have carried me thus far and I believe will carry you too? I've got three things, of course, but before that, many of you know that Matt has been doing a sermon series on the Heidelberg Catechism, which is one of the older confessions of our Reformed Church faith. And the very last question of that little book is this. What does that little word, amen, express? Answer. This shall truly and surely be. It is even more sure that God listens to my prayer than that I really desire what I pray for. So here you go. A few footholds for your prayer life that I believe truly and surely to be real. So we gotta go back to the pack. All right, the first one has to do with guidance. Now, as any camper knows, you're not gonna get far without your headlamps and compass, and of course, your AT guidebook. There's also now a phone app for this. And as I think about the guidance of God, my very favorite passage in scripture on this topic comes from Exodus 13. The Israelites have been set free from Egypt, from Pharaoh, and they are murmuring and complaining in the desert, as Matt preached about last week. And now they are here together, and God tells them, just so you know, there is a direct path that we could take, but it's probably going to lead to war and some not good stuff, so I'm going to take you the roundabout way, the indirect way through the wilderness. It might take a few more decades, don't worry. Here's what I'm going to do, says God. I'm going to go before you with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And we are told that that never left. God never left the people of Israel. Now you have to wonder how practical this was at points. It must have gotten confusing. I mean, sometimes a cloud can look sort of like a fog, and sometimes a fire might just be somebody burning leaves. I don't believe that this was a crystal clear tour guide through the wilderness. And don't you just love it when God says, hey, just so you know, we're going to take the indirect way. We're going to take the roundabout way. It might take a whole lot longer and it may wind through some wilderness, but I've got you. I'm walking before you. That is an image you can take home with you to pray in your prayer life. Lord, we don't know where we're wandering, 
but you better go before us. Be our cloud by day. Be our pillar of fire by night. Don't leave us alone. The guidance of God. Number two is the healing of God. And of course, I've got my trusty first aid kit in here, as well as a whole bag of foot care items with extra insoles and leuco tape and blister pads and essential oils that I'm told I will have chucked by the first week. But I just want to make sure I have things that I need for healing. And when I think about the healing through Jesus Christ, I think about this beautiful story from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is on his way to heal the daughter of an important official. And in the midst of that, loaded with people pressing in on him, crowds jostling with arms and legs and limbs in every direction, Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And the disciples name this for the absurd, ridiculous question it is. Lord, they say you're like a celebrity. Everybody wants a piece of you. What do you mean? Who touched me? But Jesus refuses to go on. He says, I felt power go out of me. And right there in the crowd, this woman steps forward. A woman who had been hemorrhaging for over 12 years. And the Bible tells us three things about this woman. That she had endured much. That she had gone to every doctor she could. And that she had spent all she had. Do you know the feeling? Many of us do. But she wasn't about to give up. She said to herself, I've heard of this man, Jesus, and I believe that if I can just get close enough to touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And so she does, and she is. And the miracle here is not just the healing. The miracle is that Jesus sees her. What is miraculous is that she tells Jesus the whole truth, and he does not run away. He is not 1% weirded out by the blood, by the ritual laws around unclean women. He stays and he sees her. And he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. He does not shrink from the biological or the emotional mess. Jesus says, go in peace. The healing of Jesus amazes me. Do I have any idea how healing works after 12 years in ministry? Not a clue. But I do know this, that every time Jesus in the Gospels is asked for healing, he moves in the direction of healing. Whether it is the forgiveness of sin, whether it is a mental release, whether it is a deliverance from demonic spirits, it every time equals freedom. What I love best about this story is that Jesus honors the woman's moxie, the way that she draws forth power and claims her space and fights her way through the crowds and says, I matter here. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to grab that garment with everything I've got. The healing of God's real. I've seen it. So ask for it. The guidance of God, the healing of God, and finally, the blessing of God. There is still something else in my pack that a friend has put together for me. It is this nondescript Ziploc bag filled with little slips of paper the size of fortune cookie inserts. And so many of you have written blessings for me that she typed up to make it as pack weight friendly as possible. And I am sworn to not open this bag until two weeks from today when I hit the trail on Sunday, St. Patrick's Day. But I am told that when I need it, I can reach in and I can pull out a blessing. In the passage that Gary read for us a moment ago, Luke tells us of the risen Christ in his final moments with his dearest friends. We are told that he took them on a two-mile hike from Jerusalem to Bethany and then his final parting gesture to them was this. He reaches up his hands and he blesses them. And Luke tells us that while he was still blessing them, 
With outstretched arms and upraised hands, God lifted him up into the heavens. I can picture those disciples just staring up at the sky, transfixed on this receding image of Jesus' body with the outstretched hands. Because if there's one thing I've learned in 12 years, it's that we are all desperately seeking a blessing. We are so hungry in the aching core of our bones to hear something pronounced over us, to feel energy sent over us that is more than just praise or compliments or affirmation. Biblically speaking, blessing is not praise over how someone looks or what someone does. A biblical blessing is over who they are. A blessing is what God the Father says over Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Some of you can maybe relate. I am 42 years old and I still crave the blessing of my parents. And I am blessed because they do not fail to give it. But I will tell you that this whole Appalachian Trail thing, it's a big one for them to swallow. I mean, this is right up there with like the passing phases of middle school roller skating parties. And it's like up there with all the other things that are Carrie's passing interests and whims. So it's been a lot. And yesterday, my parents were hiking in Sedona, Arizona, and we talked on the phone, and my mom shared about these fire pits at the lodge where they stayed. And you have a staff person come out and light the fire, and then other guests who are staying in nearby rooms can all come out and share the fire. So they did this two nights ago, and they were chatting with this Indian couple who are from Houston and work for a Christian mission organization. And they were making small talk around the fire like you do and exchanging information about hometowns and children. And evidently at some point, they mentioned me. And I'm fairly certain it wasn't with a ton of enthusiasm <laughs> for this trail. And then the next morning, which was yesterday morning, they run into this couple again at breakfast. And the man comes running up to them, excitement on his face, and he's speaking so fast and with his accent, and he says, God told me something in the night to tell you. God told me something. I'm fairly certain maybe my parents exchanged a glance, but he kept going and he said, God wants me to tell you that he is with your daughter, that he has important work for her to do and that he hears every one of your prayers. And in the silence of the moment that followed, in that airspace linking through the phone between my mom and my dad and me, blessing. In closing, when I first came to this church, I had this blessed, beatific vision of what your ideal minister woman would look like. She would be calm, confident, collected. She would be self-possessed and sure. She would be a wise, all-knowing leader who was slow to speak, quick to listen, and had an immaculate desk. Her inbox would be clean every day. She would not be punctual, she would be early. And not only that, she would have this connection to God that lifted her so far above the fray she would never miss a morning Bible devotion and she'd read theology every night before bed. She would be the kind of person whose life exuded answered prayer and a well-ordered home. And she would have that kind of je ne sais quoi that combines the compassion of Mother Teresa, the classy grace of a Kate Middleton, and the connection to Jesus of the Blessed Mother. Okay, so if you've known me for more than an hour, that's not me. And yet, you have called me minister. You have allowed me to be real and vulnerable and often in need, and on more than one occasion confused. You have extended me grace and mercy and good humor 
and so many chances to try and try again. You have given me a wide berth in which to grow. And on more occasions than I can count, God has used you to be the instruments for me of guidance and healing and blessing. So, in turning over a new leaf for Carrie Pattison, this sermon, I think, is less than 20 minutes. You guys, it contains only one ending, and it didn't even have any quotes. And the ending is this. Thank you. I love you. Amen.